Ladies and gentlemen, hit subscribe to this channel right now, ladies and gentlemen. In a couple of seconds, you will hear former President Donald Trump. You'll hear legal scholars. You'll hear a lot of interesting individuals, including myself, talk about something very important. Donald Trump just got a huge Supreme Court victory. And hit subscribe to read my writing in The Hill, The Huffington Post, Shalom, The Jerusalem Post, The Federalist, other publications, go to hagoodman.com. You're going to hear why the Supreme Court essentially already gave Trump partial immunity. He doesn't need full and complete immunity. All he needs is partial immunity. Then the special counsel cannot convict Trump because the special counsel is indicting him on his words. To my super chat, thank you so much, Paul Bartlett, my goodness, in Australia. God bless you, Paul. Thank you so very much. To my viewers everywhere around the world, in Australia, Philippines, everywhere, UK, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Nigeria, thank you so very, very much. This is an article where you have to read the fine print, I always say, ladies and gentlemen, from the other day in Newsweek. All the pundits are predicting, basically, that Trump will lose. This is Alan Dershowitz, who's been pretty much right about everything. I think the Supreme Court has already split the difference and said there is some immunity, not as broad as Trump wanted, not as narrow as the other side wanted. Let's send it back and see where it goes from here. If they give Trump any immunity, it's a monumental victory. The fact that they've already decided to even look at the case means that there are parts of the indictment covered under presidential immunity. When they said that they were going to see the court, to look at the court case, that was already a victory for Trump, stating categorically that some of what he did that day, which had nothing to do with criminal behavior, was protected under the Constitution. OK, you have Nixon v. Fitzgerald. You have Supreme Court precedent already backing Trump. And you have an indictment that is too broad. It's too ambiguous. It goes after Trump for everything he said. And the First Amendment, not only the, con not the, the Bill of Rights protects him, not only the part where they talk about the commander in chief. So this is just the other day talking about how Trump will be given partial immunity, which is a complete victory for Trump. That's why you have to, this is a Newsweek article, but you have to look at the fine print. So he he's going to get at least partial immunity, ladies and gentlemen. Media is not talking about this because they don't want people to understand that Trump, as president, was protected by not only the Constitution uh, and Bill of Rights, but by the fact that he didn't actually commit a crime. We'll get to that in a second. Hit subscribe to this channel. Let's listen to uh, Alan Dershowitz, Greg Jarrett, and others. Hit subscribe. I think we would all agree that there has to be some immunity, and we would all agree that he can't have total immunity for everything he did as a politician or as an individual. So I think the Supreme Court, hopefully, will come out with a nuanced decision that will give guidance to the lower courts as to when immunity is applicable, when it's not applicable. We can bring the country together on this issue as well, instead of simply having extreme views on both sides. You know, I, I actually concur with what you just said, and I, I think, Greg, what Professor Dershowitz is saying is that... Well, I think the Supreme Court looked at the circuit court decision and said, hey, you went way too far. You're dismissing yep. any notion of immunity, even if a president acts consistent with his duties. That is absurd, logically. And it's inconsistent, by the way, and this is the important part, with the Supreme Court precedent for decades ago, that a president does have absolute immunity from civil lawsuits as long as his actions fall within the outer perimeter of his official acts. Well, you know, Sean, the exact same reasoning applies to criminal prosecutions. If it's otherwise, 
my goodness, the chilling effect on presidential decision making would trigger paralysis instead of a chief executive. So America Greg, would be ruled might, by a committee of lawyers. They'd be afraid to would, do anything would, out of fear of future prosecution. Well, Greg, let me ask you this. Would a more nuanced version versus the argument of absolute immunity maybe be, of course, you have freedom of right. speech, but you can't yell fire. So he doesn't need absolute immunity. That's why this is a certain victory for Trump and hit subscribe to this channel. He only needs partial immunity and the entire indictment falls apart. The indictment talks about his speech. We'll get to that in a second. There's zero, there's nothing correlating anything Trump said to violence and chaos that day, which should be condemned, just like the billions in property damage should be condemned the summer prior. And I agree with why people peacefully demonstrated, but Democrats pick and choose the mayhem and chaos that they condemn. Utter hypocrisy. But listen to this. This is really interesting. In a crowded building. Would would that be, exactly. would there be an analogy there? Yes. And you, and and I you would agree expect with the, the court to do that. I, and Jordan... Jordan said this as well. I suspect the current justices will extend the existing immunity standard in civil actions to criminal cases and then remand the Trump case back to the trial court to decide whether Trump's acts are covered as a fit. So that's pretty much what this Newsweek article actually titled in a very interesting manner, but this Newsweek article from the other day says exactly what they're talking about. Hit subscribe right now. This is huge. And I've been telling people, before the, the unanimous Supreme Court ruling, I said there would be a unanimous Supreme Court ruling. And I'm telling everybody right now, Trump has already won. It's just a matter of time before he gets that enormous, monumental victory in the Supreme Court. It could even be publicized and marketed as a loss for Trump. But if it goes to a lower, lower, let's say the Supreme Court says, yes, Trump is not immune for 75% of what took place that day or 80% of what took place that day, which there was no correlation between anything he said and anything he did with the criminal behavior, zero correlation. The Democrat, the, the panel uh, full of Democrats and never Trumpers deceptively edited his words. Nothing he did that day. The Federal Bureau of Investigation found no evidence of any effort to rebel or overthrow the government by Trump. But if he even gets 10% of all they're accusing him of, covered by presidential immunity, and he'll get more than like 10%. That's a huge victory for Trump, okay? Because the entire indictment is predicated upon his intent to um, to uh, interfere in a proceeding, a, a congressional proceeding, his desire to stay in office, his um, this plan this narcissistic plan that Trump had. And it's all tied into this accusation that he didn't want to leave. Okay, this is complete nonsense. He wanted to stay forever as president. These are the, the fantasies, the nightmares of Democrats that they've infused within these indictments. And so you look, ladies and gentlemen, and it's right here. This is a huge, huge victory for Trump already. Okay, this is a huge victory for Trump already. Let's listen to um, Alan Dershowitz is, has been right about everything. Let's listen. He's a brilliant legal mind. Let's listen to uh, Dershowitz talk. The uh, professor Dershowitz talk about this even more said this about Republicans, and maybe you, Alan Dershowitz, have a problem with the indictment when it comes to indicting free speech. Listen to what he said on CNN. Cut to. They're also saying that he was just exercising his First Amendment right here. Do you think that's a valid argument in your view? 
No, I really don't think that's a valid argument. Because, you know, as the indictment says, you know, he, he, they're, they're not attacking his First Amendment right. Uh, he can say whatever he wants. He can even lie. He can even tell people that uh, that uh, the the election was was stolen when he when he knew better. But uh, that does not protect you from entering into a conspiracy. All conspiracies involve. So William Barr is saying he worked with others to commit crimes, but he did nothing of the sort. He did, he's protected under, he's commander in chief within the constitution is commander in chief with the ability to work alongside his cabinet uh, uh, administration officials uh, to further a political objective or an objective that he feels is a national security objective. You can disagree with Trump, but you're not president. So nothing he did fell beyond the scope of what um, national security or what a commander in chief would do. If you thought, like, look what Democrats did for, for seven, eight years. They felt it was a national security issue that emails pointing to their own corruption w- were the plot of another country to inform you. So another country informing you of Democrats cheating Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders was was completely railroaded. It was a plot by the Kremlin, by the way, to inform you of this. That's a national security issue, says the intelligence chiefs under President Obama. So the same thing. It was a national security issue when Trump felt that the results were tainted, just like Democrats felt the results were tainted because of a national security crisis. Sorry, if you if you don't if you disagree, well, half the country disagrees with the nonsense, and we know now that it was a complete and utter hoax of Trump being an operative of the Kremlin. Nothing that was never true. There was not a shred of evidence, and it was all an appeal to authority. So Trump has the same appeal to authority. There were administration officials who were telling him that hey, things are not right. So then they say, oh well, you worked with your administration officials to contest results. So therefore, um, you worked with administration officials to contest results. So therefore, um, that's beyond the scope of what of what a president uh, is allowed to do. Well, yeah, Democrats feel that it hurts them politically. So they then say that Trump was no longer president when he was. Um, when he didn't agree with the results, just the way Democrats didn't agree with the results in 2016, the biggest hypocrites on the planet. It's unbelievable. Let's continue. That's William Barr speaking. Uh, and then Alan Dershowitz is going to come out and explain. Again, ladies and gentlemen, it's pretty much they've already given Trump partial immunity. You have a 6-3, at least a 5-4, where you have... Amy Coney Barrett, Samuel Alito, Justice Clarence Thomas, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and very likely Roberts, giving Trump at least partial immunity at six to three, and then you have three liberals. But even if Roberts signs with the liberals, the fact that they've lo- they're looking at this case, so they've already I can, already given. I've explained this before. In new, so this is a very important segment. It might seem redundant. You might say, well, you know, um, it's not completely official. I was telling you the same thing before the unanimous Supreme Court decision. And it's not just me. There are these other legal scholars that you're listening to right now stating the following. They're stating the same thing, that he's going to be given at least partial immunity. He'll get partial immunity, which is a monumental victory. With partial immunity, the broad and sprawling and Byzantine and ambiguous indictment becomes obsolete. Then he then he ain't going to get on trial. They're not going to uh, convict him before November anyway because of this. This was a huge monumental victory anyway. It goes down to the courts to see what takes place as the Supreme Court gives him partial immunity, then take, sends it back to the lower courts to decide Whoa, what did this man do that was illegal to begin with? And then the process, then the indictment has to be rewritten. 
And then that goes way past November and he dissolves the special counsel. And so Democrats' blatant and sad and miserable, uh, fa miserably failed effort to interfere becomes non-existent. Let's continue. Hit subscribe if you're new. Paul Bartlett in Australia. God bless you, sir. I love you. Thank you so much. I cannot thank you enough. Speech and all fraud involves speech. So, uh, you know, you, free speech doesn't give you the right to engage in a fraudulent conspiracy. And if I could fast forward, I think he's talking about the, the electors in Michigan. And, that, and yet William Barr doesn't acknowledge that the Federal Bureau of Investigation did not find any effort to rebel or interfere or overthrow the country. So... Law enforcement agencies found no evidence Trump did anything wrong, but he was indicted anyway. Michigan and Georgia and places like that, maybe Arizona. Your thoughts on Bill Barr's assessment? Well, I like Bill Barr. He's a good man, but I think he's just dead wrong about that. Of course, this is a free speech case. I'm humbly asking every... involves uh, his uh, exercise of free speech, and not only First Amendment free speech, uh, but also the First Amendment right to petition the government for redress of grievances. The way you protest an election is to come up with an alternate slate of electors. That was done in 1960. That was done at Tilden Hayes election. Uh, that's been done throughout history, and uh, a court in, in, in Hawaii said that's the right way to, to do it. Uh, you know, it's interesting that the indictment is based on lies, uh, and the indictment itself contains a blatant lie by Jack Smith. Uh, he describes the speech of January 6th, a speech that I think was terrible, never should have been made. But he describes the speech in the indictment and, and deliberately and willfully leaves out the key words of the speech, namely that the president told his people to uh, protest peacefully and patriotically. By leaving out those words, it's a lie by omission. And under the standards set out in the indictment, you know, Jack Smith could be indicted. He could also be indicted theoretically. It's not going to happen, obviously, under the Ku Klux Klan statute. The Ku Klux Klan statute says any people who conspire to deny somebody their constitutional rights uh, is guilty of a crime. Well, what if the Supreme Court ultimately rules, uh, as distinguished from what Barr said, that everything that Trump didn't say is protected by the First Amendment? That would mean that Jack Smith uh, tried to deny uh, Trump his constitutional rights in this indictment. I, I make that point not to argue that Jack Smith should be indicted, of course not, to make the point that the indictment is so broad, so wide, right. so all-encompassing. It, it can include so much political uh, conduct. Uh, you know, we have two presidents in our history. Of all of our presidents, only two have been called honest. Honest uh, Abe and uh, Washington and, and the cherry tree. Uh, So again, the oral arguments in April and the final the official decision in June will be fantastic for Trump. This is a huge political victory, just like if Leticia James, which I don't think will happen, seizes Trump's properties. It will only help Trump. The only thing Democrats have right now, the only thing they have is venom, vitriol, indignation. They want to ruin Trump. They don't care about what's taking place at the border, the economy, inflation, foreign policy. Their singular goal, their only objective in life is to destroy and ruin the orange menace. And they've failed miserably in Georgia. They, he was a president with the power to declassify in Florida. Um... New York, if they, they might actually convict him in New York, but every the entire planet will laugh because it's about Stormy and the key witness is a convicted felon, Michael Cohen. So, and the FEC fined Clinton and the DNC, not Trump. So he he didn't he did not commit a campaign finance violation. And then in D.C., he'll dissolve the special counsel. These are all efforts to interfere. If the tables were turned, they would call Trump a despot, an authoritarian, a totalitarian. But now wonderful, morally superior, highly educated liberal Democrats are saying, oh, it's about the rule of law. The rule of law. Meanwhile, if the rule of law was leveled against them, when they, they actually committed crimes, 
They would be saying it's Trump going after his direct political rivals. Trump was impeached on a phone transcript. They've indicted him under 91 criminal charges. They want to imprison him forever. And they're the ones who aren't the despots. Are you kidding? Uh, Does that mean that every other president has been dishonest? Probably. Probably every single one of them is told a fib to get elected or to stay in office. And and we don't punish. We don't criminalize uh, political lies. And the the government's going to have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Trump himself knew and believed that he had lost the election. I don't think anybody who knows Trump thinks that that's true. Trump talked himself into believing that he had won the election. And if that's the case, then there's no corrupt motive or intent. I agree. Listen, Alan, you know him. He respects you. You all tell him over and over again, you I didn't vote for you. He's like, I don't believe you. So you get along, you represent her. <laughs> I have never had a moment when I've talked to him since the election. And I was the only one to do an interview with him after right. the election. Uh, and he has never, in a quiet moment on air, off air, radio, TV, said that he didn't win. In fact, So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm saying that essentially he's already been given the victory, okay? Officially, it'll take place in June, and April, late April will be the oral arguments. I'm telling you the victory already took place. You can disagree with me, believe me, not believe me, or agree with me, or um, side with my viewpoint, or not. But I've been right, if you've watched the channel, I've been right for years now. Uh, on everything taking place, I told you there'd be a unanimous, not just uh, a huge victory, a unanimous Supreme Court ruling overturning the Colorado ban, okay? The immunity decision is going to be a huge decision. They've already given Trump, that's what I'm trying to tell everybody, they've already given Trump a huge, huge victory by looking at the case. They decided to look at the case because there is no precedent There's no precedent to imprison a former president. Say that 10 times. There's no precedent to imprison a former president. Okay? There's no no precedent to imprison a former president based on him working with administration officials, his own administration officials, and performing a speech. Okay, so that's the issue, ladies and gentlemen. That's the issue. The issue here is that they've already given Trump a huge, huge, huge victory. Elizabeth, thank you. They've already given Trump a huge victory by looking at the case. Now it's just a matter of when Trump gets that partial immunity, high tones, hello. When Trump gets that part, and I'll be doing more segments like this, especially in April with the oral arguments. Let's listen really quickly to what's going to take place. You're going to have Samuel Alito doing the same thing he did to the Colorado legal team. Listen to this. Justice Alito. Uh, Suppose there's a country that proclaims again and again and again that the United States is its biggest enemy, and suppose that the President of the United States, for diplomatic reasons, think that it's in the best interests of the United States to provide funds or release funds so that they can be used by by that country. Could a state determine that that person has given aid and comfort to the enemy and therefore keep that person off the ballot? No, Your Honor. This court has never interpreted the aid and comfort language, which also is present in the treason clause. Uh, But commentators have suggested it's been rarely applied because treason prosecutions are so rare. But commentators have suggested that, first of all, that aid and comfort really only applies in the context of a declared war or at least an adversarial relationship where there is, in fact, a war between two countries. 
And second, the intent standard would do a lot of work there because under Section 3, whatever the underlying conduct is, engaging in insurrection or aid and comfort, has to be done with the intent to further the unlawful purpose of the insurrection or, or to aid the enemies in their pursuit of war against the United States. Now let me come back to the question of what we would do if we were, if different states had adjudicated the question of whether former President Trump is an insurrectionist using a different record, different rulings on the admissibility of evidence, uh, perhaps different standards of proof, then what would we do? Ultimately, this court would, first of all, if there were deficiencies in the record, the court could either refuse to hear the case. So really quickly, what Samuel Alito is doing here, which is why it was a 9-0 Supreme Court, uh, victory for Trump, 9-0 unanimous, is because Colorado took it upon itself to define what a rebellion is, knowing very well he was not convicted of a rebellion. Again, the same thing is taking place in the indictment, the special counsel, the Biden special counsel indictment of Trump. Three years, four years after he performed a speech, they said the speech was criminal directly led to chaos, which is not true. Uh, he used the word peaceful, and there was nothing there. Like, Democrats have made more overt claims. Uh, Chuck Schumer stated categorically a very threatening statement to, to Ka Brett Kavanaugh, and then somebody actually tried to take the justice's life. If anything, the special counsel has a greater case to imprison Schumer than they do Trump. But Trump never said anything to, uh, you know, motivate anyone to commit a crime, nothing. And he had every right to say that the results, you know, weren't just. And that doesn't mean that, like, you know, impressionable Trumpers are going to go, uh, you know, become maniacs. In the minds of morally superior, highly educated liberal Democrats, yes, that's a, you know, very logical. But if you have basic a basic grasp of logic, you know that's not the case. So they can't get him on a speech, First Amendment, and... He's the commander in chief. Then they can't get him on working. What, what they say is he worked with Republicans in other states and he worked with his administration officials to contest results. Yes, so what? So did President Obama with John Brennan and others and in the intel community. When James Clapper was asked, well, who told you to do all of this? James Clapper said President Obama did. In a roundabout way, he said that. So you think that you think that and then Biden has nothing like the Democrats have nothing to do with this It's purely objective. I mean, how much of an imbecile do you have to be to think that all of this is just purely objective? It's not objective. So what Samuel Alito is asking is a hypothetical, you know, Colorado Supreme Court wanted to ban Trump, which would lead to banning him everywhere. And then if you have 50 states with different viewpoints, you have 50 different definitions of a rebellion. And they're not going to, the, the reason that he's won already, they're looking at the case, you know, two lower courts, D.C. courts sided with Jack Smith and Democrats. The Supreme Court wasn't supposed to look at this case. They did because they already gave him a victory, ladies and gentlemen. So you can expect a partial, he doesn't need a complete presidential immunities. He needs a small partial victory. It could even be viewed, they can even market it as, oh, well, you know, the Supreme Court struck down most of Trump's argument. If Trump's Trump's 10% of what Trump is saying in his legal defense, the Supreme Court says, yeah, you know, but you really can't get him on official acts. We don't know what those official acts are right now, but if it's an official act, you can't get him. Then it goes down, and then they have to rewrite the entire indictment and there goes convicting him before November, which ain't going to happen. So it's a victory no matter what. Hit subscribe if you're new. Or it could decide on the basis of deficiencies of the record. Well, what, would we have to decide what is the appropriate rule of evidence that should be applied in this, in this case? Uh, would we have to decide what is the uh, appropriate standard of proof? Would we give any deference to these findings? by state court judges, some of whom may be elected? Would we have to have our own trial? No, Your Honor. This court 
takes the evidentiary record as it as it's given, and here we have an evidentiary record that all the parties agree is sufficient for a decision in in this case. And then, as I discussed earlier, the all the parties absolutely do not agree on the evidentiary record. I don't believe the Colorado Supreme Court even listened to Trump saying peaceful and patriotic. I think they might have addressed the issue, but then ignored it completely. I don't think the Colorado Supreme Court uh, acknowledged the Federal Bureau of Investigation found no evidence Trump committed a crime. That was in Reuters, the AP, Daily Beast. The Federal Bureau of Investigation found no evidence or scant evidence in the uh, doublespeak of today's media or insufficient evidence. It was insufficient. And there was something there, but it was insufficient. I mean, there was a lot. It, it was just not sufficient enough. You know, there's so much he did wrong, so many criminal. It was, wasn't sufficient enough, though. Meaning there was no evidence the Federal Bureau of Investigation found nothing they are going after Trump. You don't even have... They keep saying, well, what did Hunter do? It's like, it's within the emails. That's on a laptop full of incriminating evidence. My God, what more do you need? You think if Trump had a laptop where people were asking him for influence, they'd be like, gee, you know, there's no evidence there. Anyway, watch what Samuel Alito does. There's a possibility of a Bose Corp independent review of the facts. But ultimately, what we have here is an insurrection that was incited in yeah, plain sight. Uh, like you're really not answering my question. It's not helpful if you don't do that. We have, suppose we have two different records, two different bodies of evidence, two different rulings on questions of admissibility, two different standards of proof, two different sets of fact findings by two different judges, or maybe multiple uh, judges in multiple states, then what do we do? Well, first this court would set the legal standard, and then it would decide which view of the record was, was correct, I think, under that. If, if this which, court had two of, cases, which view of what record? If this of court, which record? If this court had two cases before it, and both of the records were sufficient insofar as both sides had the opportunity to present their case and, and the essential facts in the record that everyone agreed was sufficient for decision, then this court would have to look at the, the, evidence, the evidence presented and decide which, which holding was correct and then re decide that issue for the country. And certainly here, when, when there is a complete record, lower courts then will be applying that decision. And I think it's unlikely that any court would say, we're going to reach a different decision than the U.S. Supreme Court did, particularly if the court relies on the facts, the indisputable facts of what President Trump said on video and in his Twitter feed, which is really the essence of our case here. He literally told people to go home and be peaceful. Literally did that on Twitter the next day, the day after. No, that day also, later that day. I mean, the rampant criminality within the Democratic Party of like graft and bribery. And it's like, it's like, imagine if Trump had a laptop where people were literally asking him for influence the way the New York Post reported on Hunter where he's viewed as the big man and you had business like uh, the, the, the people already testifying the other day, okay, Tony Bubala and others, okay, and just for algorithmic reasons. And so imagine, oh my God, they would be like, oh my God, you know, Trump, he's selling out the country. And then with Democrat, which, you know, there's no evidence. What? Hit subscribe if you're new. Well, you had an expert. Just take, let's just take that example. Uh, had an expert testify about the meaning of what President Trump said. But do you, do you think it's possible that a different state court would uh, apply Daubert differently and say that this person should not be allowed to express an expert opinion on that question. You think that's beyond the realm of imagination? Not, not at all, Your Honor. Uh, two points on that. Number one, President Trump didn't appeal the admission of that evidence in this case. But, but number two, uh, you know, the second point is that uh, Professor Simi really, he didn't opine on the meaning of President Trump's words. He, he opined on the effect that those words had on violent extremists. And the essence of his testimony How would you know the effect on any human beings, no matter how vile they were, if you didn't speak to them? 
if they weren't convicted because of if the defense was if the, the notice how none of these people the defense was well Trump said that we should commit crimes how would you know what goes on in the mind of another human being if the words Trump told them were not categorically go into that building if he didn't say go into that building he's protected under free speech the first amendment so and then where was the expert looking at left-leaning dialogue and rhetoric and the impact after the Dobbs decision when you had churches and other buildings set ablaze. You had billions in property damage that summer prior. And uh, the words and rhetoric from uh, 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 Senator Harris, future vice president, and others, my God. I mean, in the Democratic, you know, echo chamber, their words never lead to damage in property, but there was billions, literally billions in property damage. Could you imagine if Trump, his words led to billions in property damage? And you had, I mean, and then you have an unarmed woman who supported Trump losing her life, taking her life taken that day. And yet no outrage on the left. But this, I mean, Samuel Alito said, you know, exactly like, well, what would you do if every state had a different viewpoint of foreign policy. And that's what exactly they tried to do with Trump. Trump has a different foreign policy than they say, how come you're so friendly with the Kremlin? He has a different foreign policy, okay? Jimmy Carter and Reagan had very different foreign policies, okay? Clinton and Bush had very different foreign policies. Bush and Obama had very somewhat similar foreign policy. Trump had very different foreign policy from President Obama, Bush, and Biden's foreign policy is a catastrophe in every way. So you look at the world every day, there's another country imploding. And so there goes the belief that uh, the adults are in charge. We always heard that the adults are in charge. Well, I'd rather have Trump than the quote unquote adults in charge. But let's listen to Alan Dershowitz on this again. Because he he gives, he's a brilliant man. He gives the um, he gives exactly why Trump will get some immunity. Sir emeritus at Harvard Law School, the author of Get Trump. Maybe there'll be a second book where it's don't they can't get Trump because of this. Professor Dershowitz, I've been dying to talk to you about this. When this decision broke, everyone's I mean on the left, their heads exploded. On the right, a lot of people say yes, this must be to the nation's highest court. Where do you stand on the fact first they that they accepted this and how they may rule? I, I'm not sure de facto is fair, as I heard one pundit say. This is a serious case, and I don't think they will simply affirm uh, the lower court, which went too far, and I don't think they will accept completely Trump's arguments, which went too far. I suspect they will uh, come down with a, a divided decision, um, maybe six to three, who knows, but a decision that splits the differences and gives Trump some immunity, even after he left office, for acts that were part of his presidency, but will deny him immunity for actions which are primarily uh, political. The Supreme Court did the right thing by taking the case. It's an important case. And even though it will stop the uh, these trials from occurring before the election, uh, that these trials should not occur before the election. That really does constitute, in effect, election interference. Uh, uh, You've said that, the yes. The system is playing too great a role in our election. We do not want uh, our president to be determined by prosecutors or by judges. We want them to be determined by the people. I want you to talk about the process. This was Donald Trump's right to bring it to the Supreme Court. This was any citizen's right. This is uh, the process that's in place from our founding fathers. But some on the left have been very critical, um, acting as if Nancy Pelosi tweeting, no one's above the law. I mean, this is just where. Whenever they say nobody's above the law, they actually mean Democrats are above the law, <laughs> but Trump is not above the law. And then if he wants to level the law at them, oh my God, he's a despot, tyrant, totalitarian, authoritarian. But if they go after him, it's, it's about the rule of law. But if he goes after them, oh my God, oh, rules and traditions and norms, he's breaking norms. So it's just whatever 
benefits them politically, they then cloak into some kind of grandiose, um, you know, uh, you know, romantic type of, oh, it's about the rule of law and the republic. This is, by the way, Lincoln Project, early 2000s, Bush administration, doublespeak. But anyway. Where, in fact, the case goes and should go. Can you talk a little bit about some of the criticism there and and explain to our viewers why that is so dangerous, I think, because this is what our nation is founded. These are the systems. These are the constructs like our Constitution. Look, the hard left uh, including some of my former colleagues at Harvard, Professor Lawrence Trim and others, think the Supreme Court belongs to them. And uh, if the Supreme Court doesn't rule the way they want it to rule, they think it shouldn't rule at all. And uh, these were people, uh, including me, I'm a liberal, uh, who was an activist court back in the day when the Supreme Court was ruling very much in favor of the liberal rights, whether it be abortion or the right to vote or many other rights. Now that the Supreme Court is more conservative, these same scholars are saying, well, the Supreme Court should stay out of deciding these cases. It's pure hypocrisy, and you shouldn't listen to academics, uh, and especially Harvard professors, uh, who, who clearly have an agenda here and who aren't interested in a neutral approach to Supreme Court adjudication. They just want it their way. Can't have it both ways. Professor Alan Dershowitz, it's always a pleasure to have So like I said, ladies and gentlemen, this is just the other day in Newsweek where Professor Dershowitz, brilliant man, um, says that the Supreme Court has already pretty much given him a huge victory, okay? And every day you're going to see articles, well, you know, uh, don't expect the Supreme Court to save us from Trump. The way they speak about Trump is hilarious, to save us from a good economy, Oh, don't expect the Supreme Court and lower courts to save us from a great economy and a great foreign policy. Oh, my God. What's taking place is Trump's second term, God willing, will be the most gigantic middle finger in the history of mankind. It will be seen throughout the universe. And it'll be leveled towards the wonderful, highly educated political establishment that has obsessed over this man. I mean, the obsession, the absolute obsession with Trump is unbelievable. I mean, it's beyond derangement syndrome. It's just an obsession. And they, and it's like, it's like they keep on losing even though they have every conceivable advantage. So, Hit subscribe, by the way, if you're new. Let's listen to Trump. An amazing, amazing speech. In Michigan, he talks about this and other issues also. Hit subscribe right now. A vote for Crooked Joe means the future of the auto industry will be made in China. That's what's going to be. That's where they're made. My pledge to every automaker is this. A vote for President Trump means the future of the automobile will be made in America, where it should be. Made in America. It will be fueled by American energy. It will be sourced by American suppliers. It will be sculpted from American iron, aluminum, and steel. And it will be built by highly skilled American hands and high-wage American labor. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. And we'll do it first day in office. First day in office, it'll be signed out first day in office. What they're doing to our country is horrible. What they're doing to the auto workers of this country is just doesn't make sense. I saved uh, American auto manufacturing. You know that in my first term, and I'll save it again. We did great. We did everything to keep those jobs going. We'll save it again in our second term. Unfortunately, that's what we had to do because things happened during the election that you know about, happened right here in this state also. 
Think of it. His entire career, just think of it. His entire career has been an act of economic treason and union destruction. He's destroyed unions, shipping millions of American jobs overseas while personally taking money from foreign nations hand over fist. Look at the money he got from China. Look at what's coming out, China. Crooked Joe backed NAFTA. He backed China's entry into the World Trade Organization. He backed the horrendous Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have destroyed the American auto industry had I not stopped it. You remember when I stopped it? You guys were gone. You were gone. And that was a done deal. And in fact, during the debate, I got beautiful Hillary Clinton. I don't call her crooked because I only use that name for Biden now. So I call her beautiful. She's a beautiful woman, beautiful Hillary Clinton. To change her position on TPP, they were trying to pull a fast one on you, so she actually changed her position during, during the campaign, but she would have changed it back had that been a different result. But thank goodness it wasn't, because we made things and did things that nobody believed possible. <clears throat> nobody believed possible. Biden also backed a gentleman named is Barack Hussein Obama. Have you ever heard of him? That you got to see the plants we're building in Mexico. I said, well, how do they compare to the U.S.? He said, not even a contest. And I said, isn't that a shame? You remember what I did? I said, you don't give us protection at our border. I'm going to, cha I'm going to charge you a tariff for 25%. We want 28,000 soldiers on our border. And we had the safest border in the history of our country. Now we have the worst border in the history of the world, by the way. After NAFTA, the United States lost nearly four million manufacturing jobs and almost one in three auto jobs. Joe Biden voted on that. He gave you that. Nearly a quarter of a million jobs were destroyed here in Michigan alone, including 40 percent of all auto jobs. Think of that. In fact, I had to check this number because it's inconceivable. You would think factories. 60,000 factories closed and went overseas. Can you imagine? 60,000? No, who would think that? When I first saw that number, I said, oh, somebody made a uh, typographical error. Maybe it was 600 factories. Could have been 6,000, but that sounded too high. 60,000. And the good news is, if the number was wrong, the fake news will be checking it out. So I have to say, I mean, I have to give you the right numbers. Otherwise, the fake news is out there. Crooked Joe and his payday with the Biden family, they raked in millions and millions of dollars. You see what's going on. The News doesn't want really report it. Very little news reports it. But it was the men and women who got every single day. They got up and came back home with grease on their hands, and they were the ones that paid the price. They paid a big, big price. The only time Joe Biden has ever gotten his hands dirty is when he's taking cash from foreign countries, which is quite often, actually. It's quite often. Based on what we're seeing, it's much more often than anyone would have thought. But can you imagine an unannounced raid on his many homes? He would have made Senator Menendez look like a baby, just like a baby. Can you imagine? You know, they gave him three weeks' notice. You know, they said, we're going to raid your home over documents. They gave him three weeks. Would three weeks be enough? So I can imagine. I'd like to see what he cleaned out of there. Joe Biden only cares about enriching his own family. I care about enriching your family. That's why I did this. We had record low poverty with Trump. Poverty is up with Biden. We had low inflation with Trump, less than 3%. Inflation is well over 3%, but far higher for rent, for food, energy. And the only reason it's 3 to 4%, it wasn't like 8 to 9%, is that interest rates for mortgages, for example, are 7 to 8%. They were around 3% with Trump. You're literally paying, if you're a morally superior, highly educated liberal Democrat, you're literally paying twice as much for your mortgage under Biden as you were with Trump. So yeah, in terms of the economy, record highs in household median income. You can go to the St. Louis Fed, look at all the different charts. People with college degree, people without college degree, women. All different uh, demographics in this country were doing far better under Trump. I mean, that's just a fact.
That's like not even really up for debate. The numbers don't lie. That's right, David. I'm working for you, not for me. That is for sure, and I always will. I will always have your back, I promise you that. I will always have your back. When I came into office, the auto industry was on its knees, gasping its last breaths after eight long years of Obama and Biden. But you finally got a president who stood up to the... You, you got to understand, I stood up to people that hate you. They hate you. Or they maybe hate our country. But I stood up for you. I stood up for the auto workers and stood up for the great state of Michigan like nobody's ever stood up before. And just as I promised, I withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership my very first week. Do you remember 2016 when we... The auto industry, he's right. Other countries, mainly the most populous country in the world, will dominate. And Michigan, Detroit, and it's, you know, that industry is not going to be uh, a viable industry if Democrats have their way. Okay, and and electric car vehicle batteries, cobalt, lithium, um, other uh, precious metals are mined in countries throughout the world where the econ the environmental impact is disastrous. But again, I wrote about this also in The Federalist, but again, the morally superior among us view morality as feeling good, not actually necessarily always doing good. As long as they purge themselves, like you have a lot of people who disown friends and family because of, uh, they voted for Trump, not realizing that voting for Biden is infinitely more immoral. If you want to talk about morality, the moral choice is voting for Trump. Great economy, great foreign policy. Um, we wouldn't have had the human rights atrocities that have taken place, that AOC claimed to care about at that region of the country, with if Trump had, had been able to build that entire wall. You can't even go on this platform or most other platforms and explain exactly the atrocities taking place. You think AOC or Democrats care or Biden or, you know, your, you know, wonderful, morally superior liberal cousin or friend or lifelong friend that disowns you? Do uh, you think they care? Do you think they would ever visit um, the southern geographic region of our country and watch all of these human beings suffering, losing their lives, trying to enter the country? dealing with things that they would not have dealt with had Trump been able to build that wall and actually curtailed this massive flow of humanity. By the way, with a great many people experiencing atrocities along the way that, again, that person in your life who disowned you doesn't care about, or the invasions in Europe, or the uh, calamities throughout the world would not have taken place with Trump. We know that they didn't with Trump, and his foreign policy wouldn't have allowed that to take place. Biden has a very ambiguous foreign policy. Doesn't really stand for everything. Democrats don't really stand for anything specific. It's very broad. They care about the environment, so they're going to make it difficult for oil and gas companies in the U.S., but they're going to beg other countries, and they're going to release uh, millions of barrels of strategic petroleum reserves. They're all over the place all the time. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Hit subscribe to this channel. Thank you so very, very, very much uh, to my super chat. Um, thank you so very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, be here in November. Trump will win again. He's up in every single poll. He's up in Michigan. He's actually up in Pennsylvania in many polls. He's close in Wisconsin. Actually, he's up in Wisconsin in many polls or some polls. He's up. He's very close in Wis. Uh, sorry, sorry. He's very close in Minnesota. He could get Minnesota and Wisconsin. I mean, look at the look at the polls. I don't believe all of them, but you know what? There's nothing stopping Trump. Anyway, hit subscribe, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you, Paul Bartlett in Australia. God bless you. Thanks for watching around the world. Thank you so very very much. And in the U.S., obviously. Thank you so much. In Puerto Rico, 